for your work. Thank you for that. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The gentlelady yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Ms. Bilirakis, five minutes for questions. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And I thank the panel for their testimony today as well. Uh, well, I wanted to, the first question uh, I wanted to ask is, uh, is this, uh, we talked about uh, Alzheimer's disease, of, of course, uh, and, and uh, what about Parkinson's? As far as, uh, you know, we're talking maybe, how do you know if you're a candidate for, for Parkinson's disease to participate in these clinical trials uh, if there are no symptoms, uh, maybe in early stages? Uh, and if you could answer that question, sir, I'd appreciate it. There are parallels here that are notable. Uh, there are genetic risk factors for Parkinson's disease, which is interesting because when I was in training and I asked my professor, are there any diseases that don't have genetic contributions? And he said, oh yeah, everybody knows Parkinson's is always totally random and sporadic. Well, he was really wrong. Uh, so if you have a variant, for instance, in a gene called LERC2, your risk of Parkinson's goes up. If you have a variant in a gene called alpha-synuclein, your risk goes up. Uh, we are beginning to, therefore, be able to identify people at high risk and invite them to take part in prevention trials. Another big thing that's happened in Parkinson's disease in just the last six months is the formation of a partnership with industry called the Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Parkinson's Disease, with FDA as a critical partner in this as well, and really now figuring out how we could learn from a very large amount of data that's out there but it hadn't been brought together what are the next generation of drug targets for Parkinson's disease, and how do we accelerate the process of getting there? Because we have treatments. L-DOPA has been around a long time, uh, but we certainly don't have things that actually prevent progression. They more treat the symptoms, and we believe we could do better with that. I should also say the Brain Initiative, which is this very bold effort supported by 21st Century Cures in the Innovation Fund, is learning things about the wiring diagram of the brain that is going to be very relevant to some of the things that are being done uh, for Parkinson's disease with direct brain stimulation where you actually put an electrode into the brain to try to take care of some of the motor problems. What we do right now is kind of clunky. As we learn the wiring diagram, we could be much more precise and more effective about that. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else want to add something with regard to that? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, uh, Section 3088 clarifies uh, that FDA has the authority to grant emergency use authorization for animal drugs, allowing the agency to approve the GMO mosquitoes for, again, Florida's Zika, Zika problem. We're planning ahead. Would you provide an update on the implementation of Section 3088, specifically as it relates to the approval of the GMO mosquitoes? Sorry, I, I can get back to you with a, a more detailed um, update on that, Congressman, but I will tell you there's been some discussion about the um, nexus of authority with EPA for some of these, uh, some of these products, but we did provide a guidance earlier this year, I believe, um, that addressed some of these issues. So I can get back to you with more specifics about where that stands. Well, I appreciate yeah. that very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Godley, a second question. As, as uh, a longtime champion and supporter of policies that seek to promote a deeper level of patient en engagement in the therapy development processes, uh, I'm pleased with the progress the agency has, been ma uh, has made under your leadership. So congratulations, and we appreciate all you do, uh, including the FDA's uh, moving ahead to implement the Patient Focus Impact Assessment Act provision of cures that requires FDA to disclose how patient engagement data informed a review of any approved product. Where is the agency presently uh, in implementing this provision, particularly, effort, uh, as particularly efforts to uh, standardize the inclusion of such information in the record of approved drugs so that it's accessible and understandable? We, we've implemented, we've issued one of four guidances that we intend to related to patient-focused drug development, and we have standardized um, a format for the presentation of patient-related information uh, in clinical trials. So when a clinical trial is submitted to us, there's a, there's a discrete, a very explicit section for patient-focused uh, information. And on the medical device side of our house, we've done some similar things. Um, we're seeing um, a very high rate of the use of um, patient-focused information and PROs in the development of medical devices as well. So this is a cross-agency a cross effort across all of our medical product centers. Um, we also just stood up a patient affairs office inside the office of the commissioner 
reporting into the principal deputy that's going to help advance some of these policies, really a coordinating office uh, to provide a, a, a focus of access for patient groups, but, but also a focus of uh, policy making when it's cross-agency policy making around these issues. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Georgia.